welcome to today's devotion. We are in Paul's letter to the Ephesian church today and have been for a while. We are also in chapter 3. This this devotion we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 13. We'll give a little, no, you know, let's just start there. Um, The last couple of uh, devotions we've focused on um, going into chapter 3 and verses 1 through 7. We'll, we'll pick it up there. So as we go into it, I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your unlimited, unending, unfailing love. You are so good when we're not even desiring you. You make yourself known all of your goodness and stir our hearts, if you will, to seek you and to know you. And so as we go into your word today, Lord, may you give us understanding that can only come through your spirit. And thank you so much for your word that gives us the instruction, that gives us the divine revelation that also breathes life into our lives through your spirit. And may all that we say and do and think give glory to who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 8. This grace was given. Now, Paul is writing this to the church. This grace was given to me, the least of all the saints to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ. Incalculable. You can't can't quantify them. They're so great. Going on, and to shed light for all about the administration of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. This is so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known through the church, through the ecclesia, those who are called out, to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. This is according to his eternal purpose accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In him, we have boldness, and confident access through faith in him. So then I ask you not to be discouraged over my afflictions on your behalf, for they are your glory. Now, what is the mystery that Paul is talking about? Well, the mystery is that all of the promises that God had given throughout history Leading up to Paul's own generation, all of them have now been fulfilled through the ministry and through the work of Jesus the Messiah. That's the mystery. The mystery that was kept hidden. No one knew exactly how it would be. And the re- there's a reason why it was hidden. Multi- Faceted, to use Paul's term, reason. One of those reasons was that the Lord was not going to reveal his hand to his foes. He kept it hidden. Those who wanted, this is, this is the powerful thing about God. Those who truly want to know God, he will reveal himself to. But those who simply want to know God in order to thwart God's purposes, he remains hidden to. And this is why through all of history, he would remain hidden. He, you would have to seek him. He wasn't obvious. Doesn't mean he was hiding in purpose. It means there was a, there was a purpose to his remaining hidden. Not that he didn't want to be made known. He did, but in a strategic way, understanding the forces in this world that were against him that ultimately put Christ on the cross. Those forces have been in play actually since the creation of the world. Only in Genesis 3 did they begin to advance in their destructive intention with humanity. The the, the result that you see today, all you have to do is just drive down the street and you'll see 
you will see the disastrous consequences of the rebellious spiritual forces that are at work in the world. People pushing carts, addicted, mentally, mental illness. You see abandonment by families. You see um, violence. You see shame, you, uh, fear, the whole thing. That's not of God. And so while that did take place and those entities came in and began to run roughshod, God always gave hope through, prom through his promise and through his love. He was not going to abandon his project in humanity and in creation of this world. He wasn't going to abandon it to them. He had a plan, but that plan was hidden for many years. And throughout the patriarchs and throughout Israel, he would speak through the prophets and give insight into what he would plan to do in this, in, in, in particular events in history, etc. But ultimately, he gave insight as to what he would do regarding the end of time. That when this time period that we're living in is over, he would recreate the world. And that mystery of how he would do that has now been revealed in Paul's time through Jesus Christ and his work, his sacrifice, his obedience on the cross. It's not just the cross, however, because if he had not come back from the dead, if he had not come back in a resurrected body, it would have simply been another human martyr that made a lot of claims, but could not be able to follow through on them. However, the resurrection was the defining moment that Jesus truly was the Messiah. And it was a power. Now, this is where Paul gets into verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom Every family in heaven. What do you mean every family in heaven? Ah, this is what we're talking about. God has an earthly family and a spiritual family. They're even called the sons of God in various parts of scripture. You can see that play out in, say, the book of Job. A number of times in the book of Job, you see the heavenly realm referred to as the sons of God. You see it happen in the prophet Daniel where he's allowed to go up into a heavenly realm and there are thrones that are set aside and God is conferring. We are his human family and he has a spiritual family. But there are also spiritual entities, like I said, that are rebellion. And so, as he says in verse 14, for this reason, I, Paul, kneel before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth, meaning there's two, is named. That is a powerful insight. Many times, it's if you are not aware of that, you can rewrite over that verse and not know what he means by every family in heaven. Not every spiritual being is God's children in the same way that not every human being is God's children. In fact, without faith, without the work of God redeeming us, we're actually participating consciously or not in rebellion against him. That's for another subject matter, but it, it, it is important to note. Verse 16, then Paul goes on to say, I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory. Glory is just all of his goodness come together to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. We're going to talk about that next time we come together, this inner power. What does it look like or what does it mean? Look like is not maybe the best way to phrase it because it's not necessarily a, a physical object, but it certainly does bear in, 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 in the world that we see, fruit that is obvious to see. But we're going to get to that next time. Until then, please know that the power of God and his very presence dwells within you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And may the rest of this day be a day that you experience his peace. I'll see you next time.